Hey there, this is Dan. You're watching The Salty Sea, and I am going to be restarting my series, uh, my yearly series of building lists for every single faction in the game. And I'm going to start with all the Warcry-specific warbands, all the bespoke warbands, because I see so many people either perpetuating the idea that bespoke warbands can't compete with the AOS warbands, which is not true at all, or just kind of getting a box and then not knowing what where to go with that. You know, certainly just having one box for the price that those are, it's an incredible entry point into the game, but it doesn't always put you into the most competitive place because, you know, you're, you're not sort of tuning, you're not really list building at that point, you're just building whatever came with you. So I really wanted to get really digging into the bespoke warbands first, and then when I get to the AOS, I'll, uh, I'll kind of go more general. So I'm going to start by doing the original six bespoke warbands. And I'm really going to start with Iron Golems because they're the most exciting one. Uh, I love, you know, when they obviously came in the core set starter box for the very first box of Warcry. And they were the punching bag of the game. And it was <laughs> uh, really too bad for big fans of the faction. But nowadays, they're really good. And with just one box, you get a really hard-hitting set of combat fighters where the only catch is they have terrible abilities. Uh, the abilities are awful, but that's okay because they're all just so good at fighting that uh, you don't really mind. The things I would cut for Iron Golems, I would start by cutting the Prefector and the Signifer. Now, I'm going to talk about cuts for each of these bespoke warbands, uh, specifically with what it looks like right when you get your first box of them. And you can kind of extrapolate out, you know, what you would start cutting uh, with two boxes, too. So the Signifer is the thing that has the AoE toughness ability. You really don't need it with Iron Golem, so I'd get rid of that. That, that same kit lets you either build a Signifer or a Prefector. Prefectors are okay, but the Warband doesn't really need what they do. They're looking to be just a smaller Dominar, but... You don't need that. Your drill master does that better than the prefector does, uh, so you really don't need it. The other thing I would cut is the Iron Legionary with Bolas. With the way Warcry is played now, with really liking toughness on cheap fighters because it gives you the ability to use counter, I don't really want the Iron Legionaries that don't have shields, um, whether it's the Twin Hammers or the Bolas, and just the way the box comes with Iron Golems, uh, you get two shields and then one that you either do the Bolas or Twin Hammers. I just get rid of that one in general. The things you need in Iron Golems, while they are good, they're pretty slow. Their fastest fighter is just they have a single move five fighter and that's it. Otherwise, they're all three and four. Uh, so having a quick treasure carrier can be kind of nice with them. So. Cutting the Prefector, just the Prefector, leaves you 155 points free. You can get some speed there. Uh, but if you cut the Prefector and the Iron Legionary with just your one box of Golems, you get 230 points free. So you can do a little bit more there. You can get a Slakehorn, which is the Slanesh Fiend Blood leader. Or you can get a Blood Hunter, which is the uh, blood crushers, so when you put a blood letter on top of a rhinoceros, the leader that comes out of that. Or if you don't want to cut both of those things, you can just do a one-for-one -one swap of the Prefector and a Plague Priest, and that fits pretty well for Iron Golems, um, even better than you'd think because of some reasons I'll kind of outline later. But what those lists kind of look like is you can either sort of do this first option one with the Plague Priest and then keeping all three of your Iron Legionaries, getting a couple more bodies in there, um, or just one more body in there. Or you can take this option two and be a little harder hitting. And this is all just with one box plus an ally. And you have some really solid options for, I think both of these are going to create a pretty solid warband. If you want to get a little bit more intense with how you build your Iron Golems, you absolutely can. And they actually really reward sort of careful tuning. And they're a really cool warband to continue playing. There's sort of two directions that I find compelling that I think uh, can be pretty powerful with Iron Golems. The first one, and the one that's maybe a little more my style, is sort of Wall of Iron. And uh, I'll also talk about sort of relying on attack buffs too. So for building a wall of iron, I get really excited about warbands that have a bunch of cheap Toughness 5 bodies. It's funny because I haven't actually sort of taken that approach to a tournament, but I get really excited about it. I get excited when uh, people in my playgroup build that way. And 
it's because they can kind of just win on their own by scoring points on an objective and then just countering warbands off the board. And then the other thing you've got is a really solid move three, incredibly efficient fighter in the Armiter, where for 90 points you're getting 15 wounds and you're getting this 4 4 2 4 damage profile that usually you have to pay, you know, 20, 30 more points to access. So Armiters are just really, really great at fighting point for point, but you're going to want something that can kind of get them into combat, kind of help with the movement situation. And so I really like the idea of pairing Iron Golems with Sloppity Bile Piper, which is the movement buff that's in Chaos. I play a lot of Nurgle, so I play a lot of Sloppity Bile Piper. So I like going a Dominar, a Sloppity Bile Piper, two Armiters, four Iron Legionaries, and an Ogre Breacher to kind of still have that hard-hitting Ogre that just has such an impressive profile. Still have that in your list, but then uh, get a Sloppity Bile Piper to just sort of advance two Armiters up the board. The way I would do these lists is actually really self-contained for deployment groups where I would have uh, Sloppity and the two Armiters both in their own deployment group. The other way you can do it if you're willing to cut that Ogre Breacher is you can get a really funny troll list here where you get a Dominar, a Sloppity Bile Piper, and then you put in a Shard Speaker. And the Shard Speaker is just silly. It uh, For 120 points, your opponents get minus one attack for basically within a pretty wide range, uh, six inches around the Shard Speaker, any of your models that are within six inches. And so that can make it really difficult for your opponent to clear your fighters off the board. And so now you have 10 fighters because you've gone up to three armiters. You still have these toughness five iron legionaries. There are not a lot of fighters in the game that can take an iron legionary off the board with only two, you know, with getting minus one attack, right? Because of that toughness five, um, most things that crack toughness five pretty well don't have, you know, most things with really high strength have a low number of attacks. And so when you give them minus one attack, they're just not clearing those legionaries off the board. You know, even if you have like a 510 damage profile or a 48 damage profile, uh, getting minus one attack just makes it so hard to count to 12. So this is a this is a warband with incredible staying power. And then you know what you lose with the ogre breacher on offense, you kind of make up for it with just having three armiters because they are quite good at fighting for what they do for 90 points. Um, and then of course, you know the dominar can fight too. It has a pretty respectable profile. So I'm pretty excited about these kinds of wall of iron approaches to doing iron golems. You really sort of maximize that toughness advantage that you get, and uh, and you can be pretty hard to clear off the board in objective missions. That said, this warband is in such a great place right now that it's not the only way to build them. Joe Alexander is a Midwestern player who's had a ton of success with Iron Golems by buffing up the big boys. Uh, so you have Ogre Breachers that go crazy when they get plus one attack because they only have three attacks, but their strength six, four, and eight damage, which is pretty incredible. And they have other profiles that are pretty reasonable with plus one attack too. The Dominar doesn't mind getting an extra attack. The Drill Master is pretty good with it. Actually, that Prefector that I maybe poo-pooed a little bit earlier is actually pretty reasonable with plus one attack. So is the Armiter. So a lot of places where you like buffing the attacks. And I think before the recent nerf, lead from the back was absolutely the way to go with it. Because of that uh, six inch range, you could sometimes get two or even three attacks. Plus, Skaven heroes, like the Plague Priest I talked about earlier, have that extra movement that makes them good in treasure missions and lets them sort of put that lead from the back uh, wherever they want. I still think Skaven heroes are reasonable includes for Iron Golems, um, but the nerf made me want to think about what other options we've got. And so I looked through, there are some like Ignited Fervor, which is att attached to a pretty good fighter, but is only on a three inch range. There's Champion of the War Pits, which is six inch range, so that's good, but you have to get a kill first. Uh, that's from Spire Tyrant, so that's a little disappointing. And then I found Spurred by the Gods, and that is from Slaves to Darkness. And it's only on two fighters, but luckily both of those fighters are pretty good. They're the Chaos Lord and the Dark Oath War Queen. 
It's only three inch range, but it affects self. So the Dark Oath War Queen or the Chaos Lord, they can pop it before they attack. It's an onslaught for them, and then anyone nearby also gets the plus one attack. It's a really wonderful combination. And, you know, the Chaos Lord has two inch reach, so you can actually kind of position him in some pretty um, forgiving ways to get that buff off in a way that will reach the Ogre Breacher. And it doesn't say holy within, right? So the Ogre Breacher has such a big base that, you know, you have a little bit of, of wiggle room there. There's a lot you can do with that setup. So I wanted to kind of talk about it here. The first one is going double Ogre Breacher. And for that, I included the Dark Oath War Queen because she's a little cheaper, easier to make the points work. And so then you've got a Dominar, the War Queen, two Breachers, a Legionary, and a Drill Master. So you've got four really scary combat fighters. I'm including the Drill Master there. I know that she's not the scariest in the world, but she, she does go to work when she's got extra attacks. And then the Dark Oath War Queen, who is pretty frightening in her own right, right? She's got these five attacks, uh, four, two, four, and they will just sort of go crazy when all of these people will just go crazy when buffed up a whole bunch. And, you know, six fighters is a little bit uh, slim, but, you know, for a lot of missions, if you're not just if there's any kind of tournament where you're only going to see one objective mission or maybe even zero objective missions, which does happen sometimes, like if you're doing all core book, if you're doing a lot of the cards, which have a lot of hunter missions, things like this setup with these two ogre breachers can be really, really powerful because as we've seen, you know, this, this damage profile and the 30 wounds and the toughness five, I mean, good luck beating Ogre Breachers in combat with anything that's even remotely similar in points, right? Other than the Mega Boss from Iron Jaws, I can't think of anything around that points range that can really go toe-to-toe -to -toe with it. So sort of getting two of them and bo <laughs> boosting them up with this Dark Oath War Queen is uh, really, really powerful. The other way to do it is uh, with a Chaos Lord. Chaos Lords give you a little bit more uh, utility than the War Queen does in terms of they, they being harder to kill with those five extra wounds. Um, they've got the strength five because, you know, cracking those armor sort of situations, right? There's so many toughness five dwarves in the meta now. There's a lot of reasons that you'd want to have an extra point of tough or strength because you're boosting your attacks anyway, you know, getting that sort of drop from five attacks to four actually isn't nearly as uh, painful as it would normally be, especially because you've also got that crit damage, right? So you're really looking at, say, the Dark Oath War Queen having six attacks, four, two, four, and the Chaos Lords having five attacks, five, two, five, at which point minus one attack is not as impactful as it would be. Anyway, so what you do for the list is a Dominar, a Chaos Lord, then I really like the Wither Lord. Wither Lords really get the boost from getting plus one attack because they've got that three, five damage profile. They also have the two inch range, which again, lets you be a little bit um, more flexible with how you finagle the bubbles. And he also has lethal injection, which will give you another option for a triple in situations where maybe the attack buff isn't the most attractive option. Lethal injection is absolutely terrifying for toughness three and four fighters. So then you can have that Chaos Lord, that Wither Lord, and then still have an Ogre Breacher and fill it out with three Iron Legionaries and have seven fighters here to give yourself a little bit more of a chance in objective missions, things like that. So I think both of these options are pretty powerful and really excellent ways to sort of build out your Iron Golems for any sort of missions that are going to be really brawl heavy. And that's what I love about Iron Golems is that you can have, you can build them for tournaments where you're going to have to do a ton of uh, just mashing up in the center and fighting, like these two warbands are going to be really, really good at. Or you can have them be really strong in tournaments where you're going to have to spread across the board and win objectives, which both of these two warbands uh, that are on the screen now are going to be really good at. So uh, Iron Golems are just in a great place, and uh, I hope more people try them. You see them sometimes at tournaments, usually just one box versions, but uh, for anyone who wants to kind of get into Iron Golems and tune them, We've got a little bit of proven success uh, out there right now, but there's sort of a lot more that you can dig into. 
So let's get to Untamed Beasts. They were the other uh, partner in the <laughs> core set box, and uh, they were pretty solid in 1.0. They're um, not the worst in 2.0. They One box gets you a sort of mobile combat combo warband where they've got a lot of tricks to them, and they also, all those tricks really want you to be fighting, you know, unlike a lot of tricksy warbands. Um, they want to get into combat, but then they, once they're there, they're very fancy. Uh, they work all right as is. Um, you can kind of put your first fang with your heart eater. The heart eater is a great leader. Um, this is not one of those bespoke warbands where the leader is a tax you have to pay to play them. Heart eaters are great. The thing I would cut though is the prey takers. They are a lot better than they used to be, but man, 100 points for 10 wounds is not something I'm looking to pay. What I would use with those points I would get from cutting those Prey Takers is uh, some better combo payoffs. So the First Fang and the Beast Speaker are interesting, right? So these are the fighters, and I've got them both up screen, on screen here. This is such a great picture for uh, Untamed Beasts because you've got the Beast Speaker and you've got the First Fang. Those are really the ones that matter. And they kind of walk in two different directions. They work fine. It's a perfectly functional warband out of one box where you're playing both of them, but I would generally want to play one or the other once I'm really tuning them. The first Fang, it's sort of like a Great Brace Shaman, uh, but you use a triple, but luckily you get to get an extra attack and sometimes some damage in, uh, you know, in exchange for doing a triple instead of a double. So it goes great with sort of the, these foot-slogging badasses. Um, you know, Korn has a lot of these guys that they're move four, but they just do an incredible amount of damage once they're there, right? You can pull things into them. They also work great like on objective missions with a lot of chaff in your warband. So if you wanted a first fang and then you wanted to say cut prey takers for just a whole bunch more planes runners, you could do that too. Beast speakers, they like having two scary targets so that your opponent can't just focus fire one of them. Because, you know, the Beast Speaker is going to be trailing behind them a little bit. It's going to be hard for your opponent to really uh, throw everything they've got into the Beast Speaker if you've positioned right. But if you just have one missile, like one Rock Tusk Prowler, running into combat, it's usually um, not too hard for your opponent to just take that out. So you want to have an extra scary target in there for the Beast, Mar beast Master so, or Beast Speaker. So you're looking for really good Beast Rune Marks. And you've got some options. So the Beast Speaker has a few different pretty cool friends. Rock Tusk Prowlers are not bad, right? But um, they did take kind of a 15-point nerf from first edition. They are a little worse than they used to be. And so now we've got some other pretty interesting options here. One is the Chaos Spawn. 30 wounds for 170 points is such an incredible deal. Um, and then you've still got that damage profile that I said was really great on the 90 point armator, right? The 4424. Um, it's not really nearly as uh, impressive on the uh, 170 point chaos spawn, but it still gets some work done and it's still enough that a lot of fighters are pretty scared of it, especially when you're giving it bonus attacks from the beast speaker. Then you've got razor gores, which are also pretty interesting. Uh, they've got the eight inch move and 25 health they kind of do a little bit more on crits which is a nice little bonus and then of course you can still whip them what's cool about both the chaos spawn and the razor gore is they give you that awesome little thrall reaction where you can potentially get two actions out of one if someone is charging in at your hero um, heart eaters are so scary in combat that's the untamed beast hero um, heart eaters are so scary in combat that your opponent probably isn't just going to walk into that one because they're not really going to be trying to kill your heart eater anyway. But it's still a nice little side of fries to have and I think makes both of these options a little bit better than the Rock Tusk Prowler. Then you look at things that will sort of really boost your first fang if you want to go that direction in the combo. And I would say the first thing I'm looking at is Bulgores. Um, you can do kind of blood kinds with either two axes or the great axe. I've got the um, great axe version showing here on the screen, and you can just see how scary that profile is. You've also got doom bulls, which are essentially doing the same thing. 
And then the other option is these big corn heroes. So like the mighty Lord of Corn, Exalted Deathbringer, the Wrathmaster, any of those are perfectly valid in an Untamed Beast Warband. And by the way, it's not a coincidence that uh, we're looking at Beasts of Chaos and Corn Heroes when Great Bray Shamans and Slaughter Priests are the other things in the game that have this ability, right? Uh, it's almost like Games Workshop does actually design their factions with some care. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, it's certainly, these are the things that are comboing with pull abilities in other factions. And of course, they work great with the first Fang here. And then, of course, you've got your Heart Eater because Heart Eaters also combo well with the first Fang. To uh, give you a sense of what this can look like, um, I've got first this sort of Meteor Beasts <laughs> version where I've got two Chaos Spawns to give you just a little bit more um, staying power uh, for these things that you're trying to whip and, and really, um, you know, the hyper damage output just out of these beasts. And the tough thing about that, like I said before, is that your opponent is going to be focus firing them. So having that 30 wounds is going to be really frustrating for a lot of opponents. Then I like having a Dark Oath War Queen here because if you buff the attacks characteristic on the Chaos Spawn, then you get to maybe double up on it with the Beast Speaker. It's a bit of a magical Christmas land thing. I could see wanting to maybe put something else in there instead, but I think it's a really cool combo that could potentially work well for people. If you don't like the Dark Oath War Queen, uh, there's enough room here for you to make it be uh, three Plains Runners instead. The second thing I'd want to do is um, go for the First Fang. And so I would have a Heart Eater, a First Fang, a Bloodkind with Great Axe, a Mighty Lord of Corn, and then four Plains Runners. You want to have extra Plains Runners for when you do these First Fang combos because you want to have enough activations that your opponent by the time you use your pull ability, your opponent has some fighters who can't do anything once they've been pulled. And then that's when either your Bloodkind or your Heart Eater or your Mighty Lord of Corn is just going to go and just wail on the thing you've pulled into it. That way it's going to get two attacks instead of having to, having to move attack into it. And you're going to be able to assassinate stuff that way. Um, I like having three really scary threats for the first Fang here so that uh, no matter where the first Fang is on the board, you've got something that pulling into that something is really, really scary. So this list has just a lot of ability um, on all of the sort of hunter missions to just really, really, you know, take out whatever sort of soft target you really need to take out from your opponent. And I really like that. Now let's get into Corvus Cabal. And these guys were incredibly good in first edition when they came out actually um one of those warbands that uh it would make me pull my hair out when people said like oh bespoke warbands are terrible compared to uh compared to aos ones and then i'd be like well corvus cabal is winning everything um nowadays though they're sort of finesse glass cannons with a really difficult to use gimmick um they have to be jumping on top of terrain and it's just really hard to make that work because you are spending actions to get up there. You know, unless you got to deploy onto the terrain, you're spending actions to get up there and then you're getting bonus actions coming back down. But over the course of all that, you're really just even on actions. So they're incredibly good in missions where you're incentivized to get on top of terrain anyway, like something like Search for Varanite out of Red Harvest. Um, but in any missions where kind of the action is on the battlefield floor and you're going out of your way to climb up onto terrain, uh, that can be kind of tough for them. What I would cut out of one box is the range one Cabalists. Uh, Chaff is really good in this game, but not when it's toughness three, eight wounds, range one, has to get within combat range of the opponent to do anything to them and then just gets smushed, right? That, no good. So I would get rid of those and then I go back and forth on Spire Stalkers. That is the uh, one that is on the screen right now, but that is kind of the middle of the pack fighter out of Corvus Cabal. When I play against Corvus, I find Stalkers really annoying to deal with because they've got those 15 wounds, they deal respectable damage. But then I have a lot of, I don't actually play Corvus myself, but I play against Corvus quite a bit. And so the Corvus players that are in my play group, uh, they say that, the Spire Stalkers just aren't doing enough for the points, um, which makes sense because when I'm playing against them, I don't think about how much points my opponent paid for each fighter. I'm just like annoyed by the 
more tough to deal with ones. Um, Spire Stalkers are fairly expensive, and so the box comes with two of them. I think I would start by only playing one of them, and then if you really love them, uh, go back to playing two, but uh, then you can make the decision to cut them later. So what do they need? The first thing I would say they need is staying power. Uh, they can hang out in treasure missions and reaper pretty well because, you know, they're all so quick, but they really struggle in objective missions. So you need something that can stand on a point, fight, and, you know, really do some work there. Um, and that way, you know, that gives you the sort of luxury of then maybe climbing onto something to, to then do a ton of damage coming back down onto your opponent who is stuck having to deal with your sort of sticky threat. Um... And so when you do cut your range one Cabalists, your three of them, and your one Spire Stalker, you have 330 points available, which is quite a bit. So you can do a few different things with that. I chose to um, not quite cut all of the Cabalists. I still kept the familiar here, but just add in a Fomeroid Crusher. That's the perfect, you know, high toughness, high staying power, does a lot of damage, just really big beat down piece um, that can do a lot of work in a lot of situations and give your sort of faster, more finesse um, fighters the ability to kind of do their tricks while sort of revolving around the gravity that the Fomeroid Crusher gives you. So that's where I'd go if I was just going with one box and an ally. Uh, if I'm going to kind of expand Corvus Cabal, they have a few interesting little obstacles here. One is the leader is kind of a tax. Uh, Grizzly Trophy is the buff ability for the leader. It's uh, the same, you know, plus one attack, but only if you've gotten it. But the Corvus Cabal leader isn't that killy, so it's really hard to trigger this ability. And so I think, you know, the leader is probably paying a little bit of a tax for having this high potential ability, but it's, it's just not good enough at making it happen. And then you have, you know, these action economy problems that I've talked about. Their reaction also requires that you be on terrain and your opponent walk under you, which your opponent has a lot of agency over how to uh, stop that from happening. So it can be really difficult. But if you want to kind of embrace this kind of strike and fade philosophy, um, you have to know that because it, it takes forever, your Shrike Talons are what's best at it, right? They can do a ton of damage, bombing down, doing some damage, um, but they cost 210 points. What you're going to need is to pull your opponent into the kill zone, because otherwise you actually have to telegraph your ability um, because you're spending a turn setting it up. So your opponent's just not going to go there, so that's why you need a Great Bray Shaman or a Slaughter Priest to kind of pull them in there, um, and that can let you do your cool combo. The other thing that you can try to do, because they have, you know, such fragile chaff, you can give them a little bit more survivability. Uh, Slanesh has a few ways to do that with your Infernal Enraptorous or your Shard Speaker. Uh, so you can grant survivability and then you don't really sacrifice numbers for that because Shard Speakers are pretty cheap. Um, Infernal Enraptorouses are not cheap, but they give you a little bit of extra stuff, um, you know, to come along with it. So... You know, for setting a trap, I don't think this is the most uh, competitive way to do it, but in general, I don't think Corvus Cabal are very competitive this edition, at least until they see some help. Um, I would go with a Shadow Piercer, two Shrike Talons, right? Because if you're going to commit to this combo, you're going to want two of your uh, big scary fighter. Uh, then three Cabalists with Dagger, one with Familiar. I know I just got done saying that the range one Cabalists are not good, but you need numbers here. Uh, to get this pull to work. Otherwise, they'll just leave the kill zone, right? And then you'll just put in a Great Bray Shaman to uh, get those pull abilities. If you want to go with just protecting your little birds, you can get a Shadow Piercer, your Infernal Enraptorous, a Shrike Talon, because you should not leave home without one, and then uh, four Cabalists with Spears. Those are, you know, the actual good ones. Um, those ones will be wanting to you know, get outside of one, within two inches, wail on the opponent. They do pretty respectable damage for 80 points. And then your opponent is going to have to move to attack them and is going to be getting minus one attack on them. So they're going to have a lot more staying power than they would normally have. Um, this, I think you will be able to get some work done with this list, but you should just know that Corvus Cabal do have a bit of a ceiling to them. Now let's get into Cypher Lords. And we are in kind of the... The fighters that do have, or the 
war bands that have a low ceiling here on the uh, the originals. One box of Cypher Lords will get you, again, finesse glass cannons with a very difficult gimmick. And the things I would cut, honestly, is everything. The issue with Cypher Lords is the ability is so powerful. The uh, Their ability to teleport minions anywhere around the battlefield that they want um, from 12-inch range, and then they can do them based you know, distance from the Thrallmaster based on the value of the ability. By the way, this Thrallmaster painted by Darcy Bono is really incredible. Um, everyone go check out her Instagram. I am working on, you know, collaborating on that uh, painting competition uh, with her as the judge. I have all the submissions, but I still need to uh, work on tabulating all of them and figuring out what the finalists are. This ability is great. The problem is, Games Workshop has always been incredibly gun shy about the stats on Cypher Lords. I think they're worried that if they ever pointed Cypher Lords aggressively, they would just take over everything because uh, this ability is so powerful. And so they've kind of been, I think, a little bit overly cautious this current points edition with uh, the Cypher Lords. What they need, it's a lot. Uh, first, they need staying power. The issue here is most chonkers stop you from having enough bodies to then pull off your combo, but Cypher Lord's fighters uh, die just a little bit faster than you'd want. The main issue is the mid-range fighters, though, so the ones that actually do damage uh, die pretty quickly. The cheapest ones do have 10 wounds, so that's not the worst, but it's just hard to get a lot of numbers in with Cypher Lords because the people who can do the teleporting are very expensive. And the people who can actually do damage once they've been teleported are also very expensive. They're 130 and 135 points. And so you just your chaff at 60 and 70 is just not cheap enough um, to really do the work. Or is it 70 and 80? Sorry. Underworlds is kind of the only way to bring in a bunch of chaff. Um, but this would cost you. You'd have fewer minion rune marks. And um, there's only a couple Chaos Warbands where the chaff in the Underworlds is uh, really good. I think of the Be Beasts of Chaos one, I think of the Skaven one, so you could bring those in if you wanted to, um, but it would cost you synergy. Finally, uh, nets are really helpful for them because it would let you lock something in place, and then you could teleport your two-inch range um, spear mirror blade into combat with it and then get a bunch of attacks off that way so that can be pretty powerful if you've got nets but cypher lords don't come with any nets so you'd have to ally that in so one way to do that is just bring in a true blood these are from splintered fang and they're um, a really nice little leader that gives you uh, one of the best nets out there so you can have a Thrall Master, a Luminate, a True Blood, and then you bring in two Mirror Blades with Glaive, and you just keep the more expensive chaff, your 80-point chaff, the Mind Bound with Long Sword, but you're doing all of the things that you teleport have two-inch range. So once you do lock something in place with the True Blood, you then come in with the Thrall Master and um, teleport something in to wail on it. That will be pretty dice-heavy, so not every roll will let you pull off every part of the combo but when you do pull off the full combo it's going to be really powerful and both abilities are powerful on their own even when not being used in combination so it does give you a lot of options um, just for just having you know a pretty cheap ally it does sort of give this uh, warband some dimension that wouldn't otherwise have so that's where I would go if I was wanting to kind of add to the warband on a really tight budget I would just convert up a true blood which is Really just any female fighter with a net and some armor can can easily be a true blood. If I'm kind of expanding it a little bit more, it's kind of hard because Cypher Lords are really inflexible. The things that you need for the combo to work are just de like dead set sort of requirements, right? You have to have chaff to run your opponent out of activations. You have to have a high impact minion, which means that you're chaff which are also minions aren't good enough because they don't do enough to make teleporting them matter you need at least two teleporters because if one dies then you're just out of luck and neither of the teleporters are particularly hard to kill on their own um, after you have sort of meet all those requirements there's not a lot of room to change things up so i think the only real way to change how one can build with them and how much flexibility one can have with cypher lords is really just a balance pass to maybe reduce the points a little bit on some of their things now the other thing that could happen they changed 
the ability, unfortunately, to say that it has to be a Cypher Lord's minion rune mark. And that's too bad because there is one really good, <laughs> really, really good minion in the game. And that is Nurglings. And it would be so cool if you could do a Thrall Master into Nurgle to do the whole Cypher Lord setup, but uh, Nurglefied. I mean, just look at how cool these uh, lists are. Um, I call them Behold the Mysterious Shadow Nurglings because that's how it feels. So if you do a Poxbringer, I know I'm usually talking on and on about Sloppity Bile Piper as the number one leader for Nurgle, but... If I'm sort of focusing more on Nurglings, I'm much more interested in Poxbringers because they provide um, a ranged attack. They provide a really respectable damage profile for those points. Poxbringers are really good. I just tend to use Sloppity because I need that movement profile. Uh, then you would have two Thrallmasters, five Plague Bearers, and then two Nurglings for each Thrallmaster to teleport around the board. Uh, if you don't want to be quite as meme -y, you can still do something powerful with a Poxbringer, a th one Thrallmaster, and then three Nurglings, and then you can have a Beast of Nurgle and four Plague Bearers still. So you've got 10 fighters here, you've got a lot of killing power, you've got a lot of uh, movement tricks, because the Beast of Nurgle has really nice movement tricks as well. It's such a shame that we can't put these lists together because the uh, that ability just is so runemark locked. It would, it would give Cypher Lords new life, even though it's not technically, you know, these would not be called Cypher Lords Warbands, they're Nurgle Warbands. The fact that you need Cypher Lords to make it work would make it feel like Cypher Lords has this incredible value in the meta. You know, like, they recently released Astrogan True Blades, and for Death, just having access to that leader as an ally, like, totally revamps how Death works, and now you can do death soup in a really powerful way like i know a buddy i don't want to spoil the exact list but he's thinking about soul blight grave lords in a whole new way because of the ability to bring in that the Askergan exemplar and might be bringing that to a tournament soon and so it you know if if the ability wasn't locked like that this thrall master would do the same thing for nurgle where it would sort of give you a build path for nurgle that you just can't ignore that you have to you know at least um you know it'll tempt a lot of people to at least think about it. And that would be so cool. Uh, it's kind of a shame that you can't do that, but oh well, here we are. Splintered Fang. Splintered Fang are our worst Untamed Beasts. I'll be honest. What they do have that Untamed Beast does not have is a really cool leader. Uh, Untamed Beasts also have a really cool leader, but the Untamed Beast leader is just like a mobile hammer. And the Splintered Fang leader is a really clever netter with long range, with the net ability, and it's on a much higher percentage than the average net, or this might be the guaranteed net, sorry. Um, and, you know, a damage profile that isn't the best for its point value, but is good enough that you can't ignore it, and given that it'll freeze things. Um, the issue is, uh, when you're looking at what to cut out of one box, you're kind of looking to cut everything except for the leader and the whips. Um, this is something where there may be suffering from the sins of 1.0 where um, there was a really silly splintered fang meme list that nobody really brought to tournaments because there weren't tournaments really for the most part in 1.0 until the very end so no one ever brought this to a tournament but it was incredibly powerful people who you know messed around on tabletop simulator people who just like did a lot of math hammer all kind of figured out that you could do some really wild stuff with uh snakes this was back in pet meta and snakes were one of the pets uh you could do some really wild stuff with snakes for a long time and so they've just like thrown the points of snakes just out the window i think they cost 90 points now it's absurd so, you know, you could maybe keep the pure blood because um, the universal ability makes it so that your strength is just automatically higher than the opponent's toughness. So things that hit for two on regular hits, like the pure blood, are a little bit more valuable in this warband. I would say you keep that one. And then the three inch range whips because that of course combos so well with the leader's um, guaranteed net. And then unfortunately, you know, the Serpent Caller also had the points kind of skyrocket. Serpent Callers are just worse beast speakers. Um, they're 170 points, and they have the same ability to uh, whip 
for animals that beast speakers do for you know 40 fewer points or uh, 50 fewer points but they are still usable i mean that ability is strong right and even though there are so many more points they do have you know a reasonable damage profile the thing that these need they need a couple things you need better chaff which is a tough place to be you also want a heavy hitter which you know if you're playing bingo the rule is drink whenever i say a uh, bespoke warman needs a heavier hitter um it's tough because they need both of those things and including either one in your warband stops you from including the other so they're in a little bit of a tough situation a la corvus cabal and cypher lords but there are things you can do with them so for example you could bring in a centaurian marshal which also has multiple inch movement and a net and so now you've got this ability to kind of lock down opponents and really just wail on them with your long reach and your nets and uh, i've kept the serpent collar and snakes there just because you know that's at least a nice ability that you can threaten um snakes are really hard to use because they only have those six wounds so your opponent can just at 90 points your opponent can just kill them and call it a day but they do do an you know really solid amount of damage um this can be a nice little kind of gimmicky list that won't win a lot of objective missions but um you know hunter missions can be uh pretty tough to beat um and sometimes you know sometimes nets will win you objective missions when you just prevent someone from moving from one objective to another i didn't include sort of more building with the splintered fang because everything that you can do with untamed beasts with the beast speaker that's what you do with splintered fang it's just not as good this is at least the one approach where it's actually pretty unique to what splintered fang does and so this is where i would go with them if i were going to build them now let's get into the unmade and the unmade are actually really good so i'm glad to be able to kind of end with a really good warband um, one box gives you this kind of scalpel control list um, they're really difficult to play but they are very powerful and they will reward you if you play them well for what you would cut there's nothing here that i'm like really excited to cut everything is playable depending on what your configuration is that said the uh, 100 point or 110 point and 140 point fighters are probably the ones i'm least excited about um they're kind of in that sort of mid-range hole that so many fighters in warcry are in that where they're just less effective that way um, they're trying to be kind of lesser blissful ones in case the blissful one dies but if you're going to kind of bring things in to boost the unmade that's probably the first thing you're going to drop because um, they're kind of giving you redundancy that you can do better elsewhere so the thing they need and this is pretty universal i think to unmade is they need a second heavy hitter um, and this has always been true this was true in first edition too when they were pretty similar but you have a lot of freedom here because you can take any heavy hitter that just is good at being an independent operator uh, so whatever your favorite stompy fighter in chaos is just bring it um, here i've got a doom bowl because i think doom bowls are the coolest thing <laughs> uh, they're just giant minotaurs i mean they're so cool so a blissful one a doom bowl a joyous one and then five awakened ones really simple approach everything is a netter except for the doom bowl everything can you know make issues for your opponent um, unmade have just a really great suite of abilities in general of course the blissful one has the ability to rampage on a triple if it gets a kill um, a really cool warband and then the the doom bolt just provides this extra fighter who just moves around the board doing really scary things doesn't require any of the dice that uh the rest of the warband is using and that's just generally um a useful thing to have for the unmade there's really only one build path for them but there's a lot of things to tinker with within the build path you know the build path being nets everywhere and a really mobile scary fighter who can just bounce around killing chaff incredibly effectively um and then wanting another more staying power fighter right because the blissful one gives you the mobility you need and then you just need a, a real chonker uh, some things to consider one you can have thralls to protect your glass cannon leader uh, 255 points is a lot to pay for a 20 wound fighter uh, so thralls can be really nice there especially you know if something with two inch reach thinks it's going to come in attack your blissful one not get attacked back right away and then be able to kill it next round well then all of a sudden your thrall can run in 
within one inch. Now they have to attack the thrall. Um, just gives you a ton of flexibility there. That can be pretty good. Uh, you'll just want numbers to make sure your thrall hasn't activated when they move. The other thing to consider, the stats are really below curve on the unmade, just generally, um, and that's because of the universal net ability. Uh, so you just have to leverage those nets every time to win, and that's why you want that second hero um, who just doesn't need dice, who's just a really powerful um, just fighter. Um, so kind of any dominant melee force can, can play that role, and what you'll want to do is every round you'll be using your nets to shut down the biggest threat to your blissful one. So you want something pretty survivable for that extra heavy hitter role um, because they're going to take hits because you're going to take down the things, you're going to lock down the things that could hurt your blissful one. And then on the other side of the board, your big guy's going to take some hits, right? So um, you can either spend fewer points on something with a lot of sort of life, um, for example, you know, a Nurgle melee hero, um, or you can spend a lot more points, you know, for just a little more flexibility. Two inch reach is also okay to have. Um, same as far as if you want to have another net, like a Mind Stealer Spheranx, I think that's reasonable. So um, I think the Doom Bowl, the Fomeroid Crusher, the Ogroid Myrmidon, the Mind Stealer Spheranx, the Mighty Lord of Corn, any of the Blood Kinds, a Blood Hunter, um, and I, you know, forgot to add, but all of the, you know, the 170 point uh, Nurgle Mortals hero is also a perfectly reasonable include if you want to really save some points and get more fighters for uh, more protection on your on your leader. That's also totally reasonable. All of these are great includes for the unmade, and you can sort of mix and match whatever you want, and that makes this warband really really cool. So here's a couple approaches. One is with a Fomeroid Crusher and a Chaos Warhound. Um, this, you know, Fomeroid Crushers are great. They're really hard to kill. They do a ton of damage. Um, they kill things that the Blissful One doesn't kill, right? Which is really cool. The Blissful One is much better at killing chaff than Fomeroid Crushers are. But Fomeroid Crushers are much better at killing, you know, elite, scary things, uh, high toughness things. Um, the other thing you can do is do a corn unmade. I know most people associate the unmade with Slanesh, and they are very Slaneshy, I agree. Um, but corn mechanically combos with them much better. So you can have a Blissful One, a Mighty, Mighty Lord of Corn, a Slaughter Priest, and five Awakened Ones here. Um, the Slaughter Priest combos really well with nets because you can net something so it can't move. And then you can just kind of... Um, well, sorry, you can like move something out of position with the Slaughter Priest, and then you can net it so that it's stuck there if you want. Um, if they don't, so you can sort of force them to activate it right away, which can be really powerful in situations where they want to save one fighter for last. Uh, you can basically force their hand by pulling it with the Slaughter Priest. And then Slaughter Priests are so you know hard to kill that they're difficult to really punish you for making that decision. Uh, Slaughter Priests are just great in general. And you can also be pulling things off of your Blissful One. If, uh, if a net wouldn't work because it's already in combat with your Blissful One, your Slaughter Priest can save it. Um, just a lot of play here. Just a lot of ability to do a ton of really powerful stuff. And then, of course, the Mighty Lord of Corn being one of the cheapest ways to really have a dominant melee force on the field um, to give you that extra gravity outside of you know, the main uh, situation that your Warband does. So that's a really cool sort of concept that I'm excited to try sometime with the Unmade if I ever get a box of them, because I've got a Slaughter Priest. Um, I've got a lot of corn stuff, so um, I think it would be pretty cool. That's what I got today for uh, the original six. This one kind of um, got away from me and took a long time, but I should have expected that with 24 slides. Um, but there's a lot, of, lot to get into with the original six Warbands, and three of them are really good. So uh, there's a lot of play there. If you're kind of into Old Cry, you can absolutely do it. Um, I'll be back with this particular series of Building Bespokes, first with all the expansion 1.0 Warbands, and then coming in with all the 2.0 Warbands. So this will be a three-part series, and I'm really excited about it. So until then, may all your rolls be crits.